History is a subject that we may have questioned the usefulness of when we were in grade school. As we sat in class listening to the teacher, we asked the question of ourselves, why does anyone care that in 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue? I mean, why would anyone care? We may still ask that question, even as adults. But wiser men and women have understood the importance and the value of history overall. One of the most familiar and famous statements ever made about history is credited to the 19th century author George Santayana, who said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The famous science fiction writer Robert Heinlein made a similar statement when he said, a generation which ignores history has no past and no future. The writer Aldous Huxley, best known for his novel, A Brave New World, made this chilling observation about us and history. He said that men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important of all lessons that history has to teach us. Well, history needs to be appreciated and respected and seen as a valuable servant of the present. History will play an important role in our story today. Really, it will be an examination of the history of the people of Israel. Over the past couple of weeks, we have been studying chapter 8 of Nehemiah, which tells the story of the beginning of a spiritual revival that took place among the Jewish people in the days of Nehemiah. Chapter 8 opens with all of the people, you'll remember, assembled as one man, it said, in the city of Jerusalem on the first day of the seventh month to listen to Ezra the priest read the word of God to them. And as he was reading the scriptures, the Levites, the spiritual teachers of the people, went among them explaining the meaning, making sure that everyone understood what was being read to them. The word of God began to touch the hearts of the people. They started to weep over their sins and their long neglect of the word of God. But Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites encouraged the people, telling them that it was a day for rejoicing rather than mourning. It was a day for celebrating all of the awesome things things that the Lord had been doing for them. They are back in their homeland. The temple and the walls of the city of Jerusalem have been rebuilt. The reading and the teaching of the scriptures is being restored to them. The Lord has given them back their lives. Be joyful, not sad, was the message that they wanted them to come away with. So the people, they celebrated that day with great joy because they understood the words that had been made known to them, it said in verse 12. Well, then on the next day, all of the various leaders of the community gathered around Ezra again to have him read and teach the word of God to them. And as they were studying the word of God, they discovered that the Lord had given his people instructions about celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, which was supposed to begin on the 15th day of the seventh month, only a couple of weeks away. So they made plans, and they had all of the people gather in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. The whole community went out and gathered tree branches and built these temporary dwellings to live in for the week-long festival. It was an awesome celebration of the goodness of God, like had rarely ever been seen in Israel before. Each day of the celebration, Ezra would read the word of God to the people, and they had this tremendous hunger for God's word and to know God, and it was at the center of this revival taking place among them. Well, today we're picking up the story a day after that amazing time of celebration that they had during the Feast of Tabernacles. See, the feast had started on the 15th day of the month with seven days of celebration, and then it concluded with a final assembly on the eighth day, which would have been the 23rd day of the month. Nehemiah 9, which is where we're at this morning, Nehemiah chapter 9, it recounts events that take place on the 24th day. So it's the very next day after this week-long celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. So beginning in verse 1, it says, Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Well, the events of this day are very different 
from the events that had just taken place over the past few days during the Feast of Tabernacles. Those days had been marked by celebration and joy in a manner rarely seen in Israel before. And now on this next day, there will be this confession and repentance from sin in a manner rarely ever seen in Israel before too. The people are gathered together again in Jerusalem for a special assembly, but this time they're not feasting and celebrating. Instead, they're fasting. They're wearing sackcloth and putting dust and dirt on their heads to mourn over and confess their sins before the Lord. Sackcloth was a rough and itchy cloth, usually made of goat hair, that people would wear during times of mourning and penance. It had a similar feel to what we know as gunny sack material or burlap. Awful stuff to put on. Putting dust on your head was a form of self-abasement and humiliation that was commonly done during times of mourning and penance as well. A person would sit in the dirt and pick up handfuls of dirt literally from the ground and put it on their head. You may have seen modern day versions of this in some Middle Eastern cultures where people will throw handfuls of dirt up into the air when they're upset about something. And a lot of that is showy and theatrical and not at all really the same spirit of what is happening here. There's no theater here. There's all sincerity of heart from the people here as they take this dust and put it on their heads. The people are denying themselves virtually All forms of creature comfort. They are not eating. They are not wearing clothing that is very comfortable for them. They're humiliating themselves by putting dirt on their heads. They're trying to seek the lowest possible place they can before holy God as they confess their sin and mourn over their unfaithfulness to him. The Israelites, it says, they separated themselves from all foreigners. The Lord had called These people, out from all of the other peoples on the earth, to be his treasured possession, it tells us in the scripture. They're separating themselves from all foreigners is both a sign of repentance on their part and a sign of dedication to the Lord. They're stepping away from everyone and everything else and giving themselves solely to God at this point. This is a very personal and intimate time between them and the Lord. This is not for outsiders. It's between them and the Lord. It says they stood and they confessed their sins and iniquities and the iniquities of their fathers. Notice that they're not only confessing their own personal sins and those of their own generation, but they're also confessing the sins of their forefathers. See, they didn't see themselves as a single isolated group of people in history. Instead, they see themselves as one link in a chain that stretched back in time to the very first people in relationship to God and stretches forward in time to future generations of people in relationship with God. This is an idea that's almost entirely absent in our own day and culture, though, isn't it? I mean, in our culture today, people often see themselves as individuals, accountable and responsible to no one but themselves. But I'm not sure that mindset is very biblical. See, we should instead see ourselves as a link in a larger chain of God's people that stretches backward and forward in time. We're indebted to our forefathers in the faith. And we're responsible to the future generations of God's people. The whole concept of what is happening in the story on this day is something that is almost completely absent in our day and culture. I mean, think about it. They're humbling themselves before God, acknowledging their guilt before him, confessing their sins, mourning and being brokenhearted over their unfaithfulness to him, something that is unthinkable behavior in our day. But you know, sin is a reality. Guilt is a reality. Human culpability before holy God is a reality. The reason Jesus Christ came to this planet is to live and then be executed unjustly. To provide a way for our sins to be forgiven and removed. So that we can have a relationship with God. See, we need to acknowledge our guilt and confess our sin and receive forgiveness from God in order to be whole. Denying our own guilt before God, it doesn't make us healthy and whole. It makes us sicker. It's simply being disobedient. 
There's freedom and there's grace and there's healing to be found in entering into an honest relationship with God. And that starts with our acknowledgement of our own guilt and responsibility before him. Verse 3, the story continues. It says, And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. So the people spent a quarter of the day or about three hours reading from the book of the law, the word of God, the scriptures. They spent another quarter of the day or about three hours then confessing their sins before the Lord and worshiping. Notice again how the Word of God is featured in all that has been taking place over the past couple of chapters of Nehemiah. The Word of God is the foundation and the centerpiece of their lives. It is the standard for truth and reality. It's what determines for them what's right and wrong and what God expects from them, and it contains a history of their people's relationship with God. Verse 4, it says, On the stairs of the Levites stood a whole bunch of guys on one side and they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God and then the Levites, a whole bunch of other of them were on the other side and they said, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. So there's this group of Levites, Levites, the the spiritual teachers of the people standing on the stairs of that platform on either side of Ezra Similar to this scene that we read about back in chapter 8 when Ezra was reading the scriptures to the people. So he's flanked on both sides with Levites, other spiritual teachers of the people. And this whole thing begins to take place as Ezra then leads the whole congregation in this lengthy prayer that occupies the rest of Nehemiah chapter 9. It's one of the most beautiful and complete prayers in all of the Bible. Its main theme is a recounting of the unbelievable faithfulness and goodness of God shown to his people throughout their history and their own repeated unfaithfulness to God. Now, we're going to take the time this morning to read the entire text of this prayer. I thought originally about summarizing parts of it for you, but then I remembered that the people in in Nehemiah's day, they listened attentively for five hours while Ezra read the scriptures to them. And I thought, we can handle one chapter of Nehemiah. Amen? I at least hope so. So the prayer begins with the second half of verse 5. It says, blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. So this prayer, it begins with this beautiful affirmation. You are the Lord, you alone. See, Israel was a monotheistic religion that they carried out. They believed there was only one God. Now, today in our Christianized culture, we may fail to fully appreciate the significance of that since we take monotheistic belief for granted, but it was a very radical and unique idea at that time. It set the Jewish people apart from the other peoples around them and their religions because most religions of that time believed in many gods, polytheism. In fact, polytheism was still the dominant belief system even at the time of Jesus. The spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire is what finally changed the default thinking and belief about God from polytheism to monotheism. The truth is, there is only one God. There has always ever only been one God. The Lord alone is God. The prayer then proclaims the Lord God as the creator of all things. 
whether in the heavens or on the earth, we're taken all the way back in history to the book of Genesis and those amazing opening words of the first book of the Bible and the first verse of the Bible when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. God is the origin of life. He's the great animator of all things. The NIV translates the Hebrew here as, you give life to everything. You give life to everything. The host of heaven worship you, it says, referring to the angels and whatever other spiritual beings there might be in existence that we don't even know about yet. Even these grand beings worship the one true God, the Lord. Verse 7. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of, Ker, out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite, and you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. God's dealings with Abraham are now recounted. He says, you found his heart faithful before you. Abraham is used many times in the Bible as the quintessential example of faith. God counted Abraham's faith as righteousness, it says. And as we move through this prayer, we will see that Abraham is in the very lonely minority as one who had a faithful heart to the Lord. It says, and you have kept your promise for you, Lord, are righteous. God kept his promises to the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, because God is righteous, not because they were righteous, not because they were faithful, but because God is righteous and because God is faithful. That's why he kept his promise. See, the point being made in the prayers, God has been the one who has kept the promise rather than the people. And you know it's true for us too. The faithfulness of God is what we depend upon for our standing before him rather than our own. It's grace from first to last. We are all promise breakers rather than promise keepers. I always found that that group, Promise Keepers, a bit ironic. Because in truth, we are nothing but promise breakers, and God is the only one who is really a promise keeper. God keeps his promises. And we trust not in our own promise keeping, but in his promise keeping. Because we aren't able to keep all of our promises. But he keeps every one of his, always and forever. Verse 9, and you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers and you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. So God's deliverance of the Israelite people from slavery to the Egyptians is now remembered. The Lord saw their suffering and he responded to their cry for help. He kept his promise and he saved them. Verse 11 refers to the parting of the Red Sea and the drowning of the Egyptian army as they chased after them. Verse 12 refers to the journey across the desert as God was leading them with this pillar of cloud during the day and this pillar of fire at night so that they knew which way to go. Verse 13, you came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. 
And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. The giving of the law to them through Moses on Mount Sinai is remembered and appreciated here. Through the giving of the word of God to Moses on Mount Sinai, the Lord was creating for his people an entire culture, an entire life. He gave them an identity, a way of life, traditions, a society, a judicial system, a government, a history, everything needed to build a culture and a nation with, he gave to them. See, they had spent 400 years as the slaves of the Egyptians. That had been their identity. Slaves of the Egyptians for 400 years. The Lord freed them from Egypt and he gave them a new identity as his people and everything they would need to build their own nation as free people. The Lord's feeding and care of them as they marched across the desert toward the promised land of towards the promised land of Canaan is remembered here. And then when they arrived at the border of the promised land, the Lord told them to go in and take it. It's theirs to enjoy. It's his blessing to them. Take it. Go in. I've given this to you. But verse 16. But They and our forefathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and did not forsake them. See, it says they refused to go in. Some of those who had been sent to explore the land gave reports that there were giants living in it. They accused the Lord of leading them out of Egypt and across this desert just up to the border of the promised land just to wipe them out. It was all this big, sick, divine joke that God was pulling on these people. They accused God of intending to do evil to them rather than good. They wanted to go back to Egypt where they could live comfortably as slaves rather than go forward and fight as free people. They were getting ready to stone Moses and appoint a new leader to take them back to Egypt when the cloud of the Lord's presence descended on the tent of meeting. And he spoke and he told that whole generation of people that because of their lack of faith, they would never enter the promised land. Every one of them would die in the desert. Their children instead would go in to inherit the land after they were all dead. And so... Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies, you and your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. (sighs) Casting an image of a calf was a much larger affront to God than you might realize. See, it was not just an idol of a calf that they had made. It was an image of a God worshipped by the Egyptians. It was an apis bull calf, which was one of their gods. It's hard to imagine the insult to the Lord this would have been the Lord had delivered these people from this oppressive, abusive slavery under the Egyptians, and in turn, they reject him as their God, and they fashion for themselves an idol of one of the gods of their slave masters, the Egyptians, to worship instead. Shocking. Shocking. 
And the message in the prayer is that even when they had done all of this, God remained faithful to them. Verse 19, you and your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud led them in the way that they would go. And then in verse 20, you gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. The Lord took care of these rebellious, ungrateful, whining, faithless people for 40 years as they wandered in the desert. They lacked nothing, and yet they appreciated nothing. Why did the Lord do it? Because he made a promise, and he keeps his promises. He did it for their children's sake. He had made a promise to Abraham. And then he extended that promise to the children of these people. He made sure that the children all survived so that they could inherit what had been promised. 22. And you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every corner. So they took possession of the land of Sion, king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went in and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hand with their kings and the peoples of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities and a rich land and took possession of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness." Most of the events that are talked about in these verses are recorded in the book of Joshua. The children of the Israelites who had been delivered from Egypt, they went into the promised land and they took possession, it says, of cities they they did not have to build, vineyards and orchards that they did not have to plant, houses that they did not have to build that were already full of furniture, God gave them the houses and the property of the wicked people that they conquered and dispossessed who were living in Canaan already. Verse 25, it says, So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. I love that. And, you know, I love how the Bible describes the goodness of the Lord because I know it flies in the face of modern nutrition, but man, I love it when it says, and they were fat. (laughs) They were so filled to overflowing with God's goodness. His blessing on them. Overwhelming abundance. They became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Verse 26, nevertheless, such a heartbreaking word to read because it signals the repeated unfaithfulness of the people toward the Lord. They were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn back to you and they committed great blasphemies Therefore, you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering, they cried out to you, and you heard them from heaven. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors to, who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before you, and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven, and many times you delivered them according to your mercies. The events described here are recorded in the books of Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. See, Ezra is taking us through the whole Bible in this prayer, recounting the history 
of the people in their relationship with God. It says they rebelled and they turned away from the Lord again and again and again, just like their forefathers had done. See, they didn't learn anything from history. 29. And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandment, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, they shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirits or your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. The Lord allowed them to be conquered by other nations around them, but he didn't let them be completely wiped out. In his great mercy, he always preserved them, hoping they would turn back to him one day. And in beginning in verse 32, the prayer begins to address the present circumstances that the people are in. It says, Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant, keeps promises, and steadfast love, let not, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them. Even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruits and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. And its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please. And we are in great distress. They're under the subjection of the Persians at present. And although they have been allowed to return to their homeland of Israel by the Persians, they're still not free people. They're subjects of the Persians. See, they were slaves in Egypt. God delivered them from that. Brought them into a land of freedom of their own. But now, through their own unfaithfulness, they are slaves again in the land that God had given them. The land God had given them to live in freedom and to build this new life. But they've squandered it away again and again. And in the prayers there goes, here we are. In the land that you had intended to give us to be this great blessing for us, a place for freedom, for us to build a life and a nation and a culture. But even here, we have made ourselves slaves through our foolishness. They acknowledge that they have no one to blame for any of it except themselves. There's no blaming of God for their suffering and hardship. And this is a significant thing to take note of. God is so often blamed for all that is wrong with this world. People are always saying, how can God allow these things? If God is good, why does he not do something about this? How can can I believe that he is good and loving when this thing is taking place in my life? The answer to those questions is God has done something about what's wrong with this world. Although it's not his fault, he's taken the responsibility to do something about it. 
He entered into this sin-torn world, became a human being, died as a sacrifice for our sins, which are the real cause of all of the awfulness in this world, our sins. God is good. God has always been good. God has been good to all of us. Blaming God for what is wrong in this world and in our lives is the height of human arrogance. We made the mess, not him. And through Jesus, God offers us salvation from the mess. And this is what is uniquely confessed in this prayer by these people. They own their mess. They confess it. They go, it's our fault. It's not yours, God. See, we owe him our gratitude rather than blaming him. Oh, what a rare individual it is in our day that will do that. Finally, verse 38. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. So taking into account all that has been done throughout Israelite history and their repeated rebellion and disobedience of God's word, they're now making a binding agreement and promise on this day to obey the Lord. They're they're actually going to put it in writing and they're going to sign it. That's what's being described here. And we'll actually read the words of this agreement and this promise that they're making to the Lord next time in verse or in chapter 10. It's interesting, isn't it? They confess and in this prayer and then to put their words in action. They they write up a promise to the Lord, and they're going to sign it. I'm closing this morning, you guys. The purpose of Bible history for us, why we went through all of that today, why we read about the history of these people and their relationship with God, why do we do that? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 6, Paul's writing here, and and he lets us know what, what the purpose of Bible history is for us. Now, these things, they took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Referring to that wild party that they had when they made that idol calf out in the desert and they began to worship that God of Egypt rather than the Lord. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. You may be able to endure it. So the history of these people, it serves as an example for us so that we will not repeat the same mistakes. It serves as a warning for us that we will not become overconfident, that we're as vulnerable and as weak as they to these kinds of failings. And so I, I remind us again of that statement made at the beginning By Santiana, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. This is why we study history. This is why we go back and we we look at the relationship that these people had with the Lord. God is good. He loves us. 
He has good things for us. He cried out to them, please don't squander what I want, what I want to give you. And he says the same to us. He goes, I'm a promise keeper. Trust me. Follow me. Be faithful to me as I'm being faithful to you. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your goodness, for your promise keeping. And we thank you that you have recorded the history of people in relationship with you in the scripture that we can go back and read and learn from, be warned to be humbled by, to be reminded of things that we want to avoid in our own life. I pray for each one here, Lord, that we would draw near to you today. Take hold of your hand. Be reminded of how precious we are to you, Lord. Thank you that you have never given up on us, Lord. That you are faithful. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.